Here's something that you need to know. The name Jonah means dove. Why is it important that Jonah's name means dove? When was the last time, or what, does, what do doves represent typically in scriptural stories? Peace and, CJ? Love. And now, we have a story in the New Testament where Christ is being baptized, and it says that the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. So there's just a little bit of allegory going on here. And um, here's one thing that you have to know about the Bible. Sometimes the Bible's confusing. Just, you just have to know that. And it's confusing, I think, for a reason. It's confusing not so that you'll turn away and walk away from it, but like a burning bush on the side of the hill was to Moses, he saw it from afar and he went, that's confusing to me. I should go and check it out. Moses, through drawing near to the burning bush, was able to hear the whisper of the Lord coming out of that burning bush. So in the same way, we're going to address some confusing things in the text. And by it being confusing, we're going to be drawn in closer. Jonah's name means dove, the peace of the Lord. And the book starts out this way. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. We are introduced to a couple main characters. And we have to understand that the word of the Lord has come to Jonah. Now, we preached last week about the word of the Lord. The sword of the Spirit is something that Christians are supposed to be able to wield and to wield it skillfully. And Paul teaches us that the sword of the Spirit is the word of the Lord. And we talked about the word of the Lord, the logos of God being more than just Scripture. And here we'll see it right here in Scripture. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah and it gives him a message to preach. It says, if just through the introduction, the introduction which just plops us right in the middle of the story... Go, dove, and give my word to a great city that is full of sin and evil. Just a little bit of background. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. They are the arch enemies of Israel. And in a few years, past the time of Jonah, they're going to invade Israel and completely wipe them off the map. Totally. Now, Israel does this game where it tries to be just a little bit holier than its neighbors so that it can always claim God's favor. And this is, our story is going to be about how God, the word of the Lord, starts preparing for the judgment of Israel by sending the word of grace, the word of hope, the message of the dove to the Assyrians, the bad guys. I want you to pay attention to something. Because in our very next verse, it says this, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, there's some debate about exactly where Tarshish is. But we know two things for dang sure. The first is that it's in the opposite direction of Nineveh. Okay? So we know that for sure. We just don't know how opposite in the direction of Nineveh. Okay? And then the other thing that we know is that it's far, far away. Now, what's up for debate is how far away. But we know for certain that Jonah hears the word of the Lord, right? and it doesn't tell us one of the things that we're going to discover as the story goes on, why Jonah's running. Here's a faithful prophet of God who hears the word of the Lord, and his immediate thing is to what? Flee from the presence now, if we paid attention at all last week, what is the armor of God? It's His presence. Being in the presence of God is putting on the armor of God. Now, you can nuance it and talk about the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, and all that stuff is helpful. 
But you can't forget that it's God's armor and that we must be in His presence in order to put it on. It's us wrapping ourselves in the character qualities of God. You can't copy that. You have to actually go to the source and be there. And Jonah, in our story, Jonah hears the word of the Lord, knows what he's supposed to do, and where does he go? Away from the presence of the Lord by fleeing to Tarshish. Now, Kids, can you flee from the presence of the Lord? Physically speaking, is there any way that you, anywhere that you can go that God won't see? CJ, I see that hand. Go ahead. No. Okay, so even children know that there's no place on earth that you can go to flee from God's presence. Right? This is a physical impossibility. We know that God exists everywhere. What then is Jonah trying to do? Is he stupid? Well, he's stupid from running from the presence of the Lord. But what he is trying to accomplish is not necessarily a physical act. This is one of the things we have to understand about the book of Jonah. The book is prophetic. And that means that there are going to be physical actions that represent something else. We're going to see that God tries to stop Jonah from leaving his presence physically. Even though we know that it's impossible... Even if Jonah would have made it to Tarshish, God still would have been there. Right? We know that, and yet God tries to stop him from doing that. Why? We're going to see that the story of Jonah, as often happens with the prophets of the Lord, is a physical playing out of something spiritual that's happening. Okay? So, in a sense, it's a historical story that's meant to teach us something about spiritual truths. In a sense, it's allegory in which we're supposed to sort of identify physical things that are happening in the story and say, I wonder what that's like spiritually speaking in my life. Where is Tarshish? But because if we actually knew exactly where it was on the map, we could all circle it and go, don't go there. Because maybe the presence of God isn't there. I've learned my lesson from the book of Jonah. No, 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 no. Think in your life. Where are the places that you go to flee from the presence of the Lord? He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. You see how it's mentioning over and over again? Here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to leave the presence of the Lord. He's doing it by paying this sum of money down at the docks of, at uh, Joppa and he's sailing away. But the Lord, as your tour guide through this story, anytime you see in the story, but the Lord, or but Jonah, pay attention. Because the text is trying to make a point. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. We have to ask ourselves, Is God throwing a temper tantrum here? Is God mad? As it turns out, the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah is not about God's wrath. It's a book that's almost about God's wrath. The whole thing is about how God is almost angry. God almost destroys people. God almost obliterates. God almost kills, but he never does. This is a story about a lack of judgment on God's behalf. This is actually a story about God's patience. This is a story about God's love. This is a story about God's word in the form of a dove going to his enemies. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So, how likely do you think, if this was simply a a physical story that's just about keeping us away from Tarshish, wherever that is, that in the middle of a great storm, when all the sailors are freaking out and they're saying, this isn't natural, this, there is a, a spiritual entity at work here that's trying to destroy us. And they're all freaking out that the prophet of the Lord 
is in the bottom of the ship sleeping. Why is Jonah asleep? What kind of sleep is this? The text is confusing. It doesn't tell us. It just tells us that he's asleep in these amazing circumstances to make us question, how could anybody sleep through that? But it doesn't answer the question. Let me give you a couple of my guesses. First is that Jonah relies on God as his salvation. And so he understands that this tempest, this great wind, the ship threatening to break up, is just God trying to get his attention because God loves him. Jonah then, if I am right, by sleeping is sort of doing what perhaps one spouse might do to another. When one is very, very upset, very, very, and the other one just gives the silent treatment and goes to bed. This is an act of spurning God's love. This is an act of emotional terrorism. Jonah doesn't want to do what God's asked him to do, but more importantly, he doesn't want God to do it in the first place. Jonah is running from the presence of God so that he can get his way. Jonah is trying to change God's will through emotional manipulation. Jonah is saying to God, if you do this, I'm out. You will lose me. And if you love me, you'll think twice. Now, side note, and we can take this, just a physical thing. If you're ever in a boat, okay, and all the sailors are freaking out and throwing all the cargo overboard and they're crying out to their gods, you can freak out too, okay? You can start praying too. We can learn that lesson. Jonah, on the other hand, he, he, doesn't, he does not get it. They're hurling out the cargo and he is fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? In other words, what are you doing, lazy bones? Don't you know we're all about to die? Arise, get up. Call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Okay, so... In my mind, before I really dived into the text, I was thinking that this is like one of those raft kind of boats, you know? And all the sailors are like clinging to something on the top. There happens to be some compartment down in the bottom. But actually, if the ships of Tarshish are what we think they are, and that is seagoing vessels, long distance seagoing vessels, most likely they batten down all the hatches. Okay, if the ship is threatening to break up, the whole ship is threatening to snap in half because it's going up and down the waves. No sailor is, you know, in the crow's nest, hanging on with his binoculars, shouting out to his buddies below. Everybody is below decks, and every time they open up the hatch, it is to great peril to themselves, and it's just to throw weight out to improve their ballast. All of the sailors are probably below decks, and Jonah's in the very bottom, snoring away. And I wonder, what are the storms in my life in which I have chosen, I have chosen deliberately to crawl to the bottom of the ship and to sleep? And we have here even the pagans screaming at Jonah, saying, this is time to freak out. Jonah keeps his cool. They say to one another. Okay, so, so they address Jonah, right? Jonah's not doing nothing. He's not getting up. He's not crying out. He's not, this has not caused him to swing into action. All of a sudden, they consult with one another. They say to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they, they've lost all the cargo, and they're saying, okay, somebody here is bringing a curse on us in the way that sailors do, I imagine. Right? Jonah's in the corner, and they're huddled up. Jonah's still asleep. Let's roll some dice. Let's draw, let's draw some straws and figure out whose fault this is. Now watch what happens. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. 
All right, so we know that God's involved here. Actually, God's doing this. So the guys are huddled up, right? Maybe there's a torch burning in the bottom of the ship. They're scared to death. They've thrown over everything they can, and they've got this lazy passenger who's sitting there in a spiritual stupor, a physical stupor who just won't care. And they cast lots to figure out whose problem it is, and all of a sudden, all eyes turn over on Jonah. And Jonah's sitting in the corner, I imagine, sort of rocking back and forth in his hammock, rubbing his eyes. And they said, count up the questions with me, because this is going to come out pretty awesome. They said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. Okay, now, the I am a Hebrew is going to answer every single question except for two. Whose account is this evil upon us and what's your occupation? I am a Hebrew answers everything else. Where are you from? What country are you? What people are you? I'm a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. What, what question is he answering? Occupation and why God's mad. His occupation is to fear the Lord. And by the way, this God that I serve is not just any old God. This is the supreme being of the universe. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So we get this revelation later on in the story that when Jonah is on the docks paying his fare, you know, there's a customs agent or something there who's saying, what do you want in Tarshish? Oh, I'm fleeing the presence of the Lord. All right, do you have your money? Yeah, I do. All right, come on board. Hey, we're taking a passenger. What does he want in Tarshish? He just wants to flee from the presence of the Lord. Cool. The storm hits and everybody starts freaking out and they say, what are, what's your occupation? Oh, my occupation is to fear the Lord. To be in his presence. To minister to him. Oh, no. The guy who's running away, that's his full-time job? And God wants him back. All of a sudden, the sailors know that the last thing they want to do is stand in between this divine being and this reckless prophet who is spurning the loving advances of God in order to tick God off. Jonah's not afraid that the ship will break up. Why? Because God loves him. God's going to pursue him. So he's going to try to do his thing in order to get his way, and the sailors just want nothing to do with it. So they say to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. So sort of from the time that, I, I mean, I imagine, you know, in the darkness of the hold of this ship, that God, he says, I'm a Hebrew. It's my job to fear the Lord the maker of the sea and the dry land. And all of a sudden, it's like, boom! A shock of thunder comes out. And all of a sudden, the ship lands really heavy and the sea starts getting even more. And the sailors are going, oh no, please tell us, how do we stay out of this? Be the prophet to us. Do your job. You know this, God. Just get us off the hook. What are we supposed to do to you? And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now, because of the next sentence, I can make this claim. Jonah is bringing the, them into the mix. He is, he is saying, no, 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 this isn't something you can just do to me. Throw me in the ocean then. Kill me. Remove me from God's presence. That's the only way that you'll survive. Then, because I'm a prophet of the Lord, remember guys like Elijah and stuff, whenever people messed with the prophets of God, God went after them. Whether they were right, wrong, or indifferent, God protected the prophets' lives. And now these sailors, these pagan dudes, know enough to know, I don't want to mess with that God. I don't want to mess with that God. So when Jonah sort of self-righteously says, throw me in the ocean, kill me, then the sea will quiet down for you. 
Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. These sailors are caught, sort of, they've been drawn into the lover's triangle, so to speak. And they want absolutely nothing to do with it, and they've tried everything they can to get out of it. And so they sort of, they're going to throw him into the sea, but they're going to hold their nose while they're doing it. You know, like, God, this action disgusts even me. I don't know why you want me to do this, but it's you. So they're throwing him over saying, God, don't, do not, do not make this against us. Meanwhile, the sea is getting more and more angry. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. I'm glad they didn't just push Jonah. There's something deep inside me that is satisfying to know that they hurled him. That, that on some level or another, they, had, they were chucking him as far away from them as possible. They didn't just make him walk the plank and give him a nice little push. They went, fine, you want out of here, load him in the cannon and shoot him over the horizon. We want him and his business with God to be way over there. And the Lord... Oh, excuse me. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. I mean, you think? Yeah. Yeah. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. You know what I think is so interesting is that even though these guys are seafaring folk, and for all of time, like as soon as the first, you know, knuckle dragger put a log into the water and started riding around the bay on it and bringing it back, seafaring folk have had sort of a bad reputation for their morality, right? Sailors are supposed to be kind of these very immoral people. They go from port to port spreading STDs and, and, uh, and nastiness, spending up all their pay in one night, and uh, loading back on the boat and uh, working out the kinks of their hangover for the next three months. And these guys understand. They understand that the Lord demands a sacrifice and that the Lord wants to be Lord. They offer vows. So it doesn't actually matter what they vow, but by making a vow to the Lord with a sacrifice, they are admitting that He is the Lord. And they are hoping, by making vows, sort of getting on his team rather than being on the opposite team, that somehow salvation of some sort will happen to them, even if it is sort of a Teflon coating every time another storm comes. But they want to be on God's side. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right. Now our story's really going to get crazy because we're going to see Jonah do something physically that he threatened God that he would do. Like, hurl me into the sea. Sort of, I want to go to hell rather than be a part of that. I want your eternal anger against me before I go out and preach to the Ninevites. And on his way out, he's doing his best to drag innocent people in under the wrath of God. And so God is going to allow Jonah to go to hell. All right? On this physical journey, this story, this, the whole next chapter is about Jonah's experience in hell. And because this seems so physically impossible, what we have in our imaginations usually is that the sailors do the one, two, three overboard. He hits the water. No sooner does he hit the water than a giant well, whale that has a huge pocket of air in its belly swallows him, and he lives off of, you know, plankton and crawdads floating around on a raft in the belly of a big, big giant whale. But that's actually not what happens. As we'll see in Jonah's prayer, we'll see that Jonah actually suffers death without physically dying by a miracle of the Lord. He drowns. He goes to the very bottom of the ocean. Let's read. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, 
Right, so this is once the fish has eaten him. He's fish food at this point. He's in the belly of the, of the fish, and he is now crying out to God. You can't cry out to God if you're dead. He's alive. And this is his account of what has happened. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, that's the Hebrew word for hell or the place where souls sort of were captured until the judgment day, I cried and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep in the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me, all your waves and your billows passed over me. If a wave or a billow is going to pass over you, and you are in the darkness of the deep, how far under are you? Pretty far under. You're under the water. He's not floating around on the surface. He's saying, I sank. And I said, I am driven away from your sight. Listen to his words. I am driven away from your sight. Not I ran away from you, God, but I was driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look upon your holy temple. This is a desire he is stating to go back to the presence of the Lord. He's going to go back to the temple, back to what he was doing before. He's saying, okay, I'm done. I'll go back to where you had me in the first place. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the root of the mountains. I went down to the land or the earth whose bars closed upon me forever. Let me pause right there. Jonah is saying, I drowned, I so drowned, I was so drowned, I went all the way to the bottom of the ocean. I was so far down that the mud there locked me in and seaweeds were wrapped around my head. I don't think that he's upside down in the shallows, right, with a little seaweed in his hair. He's all the way at the very bottom, stuck in the mud, totally hopeless, and God is not allowing him to die. The, the weeds are wrapped around his head. He's got nothing except a prayer. When my life, excuse me, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up, my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols, who's he probably talking about here? Everybody that up to this point in time, know, or Jonah is trying to get God to be wrathful on. And he's saying, those who pay regard to vain idols, forsake the hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's saying, yes, God, only you can save me. You're the one who got me in this situation in the first place, but yes, only you can save me. And don't think about all those people who are praying to vain idols. I know who the real God is, and they don't. So it doesn't matter what kind of sacrifices they make. I know what kind of sacrifice you want. I'm going to go back to your presence, into your holy temple, and I will thank you. I will personally thank you. Relationship restored, and only you can do this, God. It's amazing to me that Jonah, while in the pit of hell, while in a fish's belly, with all of the putrid stuff that has got to be in a fish's belly, is still, he has gotten to the point of repentance where he's saying, I don't want this pain anymore, and I know that I can come into your presence because you like to save people. You like to save people, God. And I wonder... I wonder how I do the same thing. Where I feel the consequences of my actions and I get to the point where I say, 
God, you've brought about all this stuff to turn my attention back to you. Fine, I'll turn my attention back to you. You're making me do this. I'm coming back to you, God. I'm coming back to you, and I'll even thank you for the experience. But notice what Jonah did not say. Right? It's actually painfully obvious. What didn't he say? I will obey you, God. I'll obey you. I will do what you asked me to do. I was wrong. I was wrong to do all that. Jonah is still being an emotional terrorist. He is still trying to manipulate God, but now he is trying to manipulate God through a turning halfway back to God. So the first part of the story is Jonah going, no, God, I don't want anything to do with you. And then the second part of the story is this, I'm turned halfway back. I'm turned halfway back. Let's see how this works out, God. I'm coming back to your presence. Let's try this again. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. It was uh, a while ago when I was listening to this, as I was preparing for the sermon, and I was praying like, God, show me something new about this passage. Show me something new. I realized that this sentence right here that I just read to you, where we're going to land on, or where we're going to end up, this is our sort of wrapping up, is a joke. The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Why is that a joke? Why is that funny? Because the whole book is about God getting Jonah to obey him, and it takes four chapters, and we don't even really get any resolution. And there's one sentence smack dab in the middle of it. There's this key player, right? The whole book, actually, if this fish wasn't obeying God, the prophet couldn't have been saved. (laughs) Jonah is what's broken. It's not creation. Sort of this divine joke that, that the Lord would just speak to the fish and that it would obey him. Same sentence. The fish didn't even think about it. So Jonah is saying, like, yeah, one of the things that, I, that makes me special, God, is that, is that I know you and, and that I have this wisdom. I'm not praying these stupid idols like these, these guys who just vowed all these promises to you in my story. They still don't even know who you are. They don't even know where your temple is, but I do, and I'm headed back there, baby. And then I will praise you as you uh, like to be praised. And yet, obedience isn't even on the table for him. He still isn't even obeying God. And all we get is a comma in the middle of God speaking to the fish and the fish obeying. Now, think about the sailors. Think about the sailors. Think about, think about everybody else in the book of Jonah. Who obeys and who disobeys in the book of Jonah? Everybody obeys right away, on time, because they're scared and they, and, and they want salvation and they understand who God is, Jonah disobeys the whole time. Why? Why does Jonah disobey? I think this is really the question. I think this is the question. This, this is sort of the knife that God, the sword of the Spirit, actually, that God is poking into my heart. Perhaps he's poking it into yours. How is it that our familiarity with God Our being in a relationship with him makes obedience optional. How come when we're talking about what we know we're supposed to do, what God has clearly asked us to do, somehow our relationship with him doesn't make us do it, but actually gives us an excuse not to do it? I want you to think about that. Ask yourself this. What does this say about God, about his fury and about his love? What does this say about you? Do you know a Jonah? Are you a Jonah? What is God trying to say to you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are wonderful. You are amazing. And your scripture is amazing. Your word is amazing. Father, your word has come to us. And it says, obey. And it says not just obey, but that you have prepared a message for the world, that you send us out as a dove. Father, would you teach us the lessons of Jonah? 
on how we can obey you, how we can love you, how our relationship with you would make our obedience sure rather than unlikely. God, I ask that your love and your fury, your presence would be wrapped around us, that we would feel how you feel for us and that that would enable us to have the courage to obey. Father, I thank you for this. In your name I pray. Amen.